Super Woo Radio, where we are awakening into being free and sovereign. It's a place where minds hurt and hearts sing as we break through the barriers that have been holding us back. So be prepared to have belief systems confronted as we take the journey of the truth seeker and explore the answers to life's biggest questions. Remember, truth is stranger than fiction. So come along for an awareness expanding experience with George and Jason. Hello everyone and welcome to Super Woo Radio, episode number four. Jason, my fantastic co-host, are you there buddy? I am George. How are you feeling today? Oh, feeling really, really excited. We have another incredible guest. And today we have James Pask. Not known at all, is he, in the speaker circuit? He's not. He's one of our homegrown local heroes. Uh, one of those hidden gems that uh, it's about time the world learned more about. Um, there's healers and there's healers. And he's part of the new wave that you've been articulating lately. We've known James for a while now, and we thought he would be uh, a perfect guest to bring up the topic of health and healing, um, something I know everyone's interested in and something, George, you've had a lot of experience with, with your illnesses, and um, I have through my mother's experiences, and no one better, I think, to, than James to come on and share his wisdom and his journey and what he thinks about health and healing. Oh, I totally agree. This This gentleman is full of wisdom and it's just busting to come out and be shared with our human family and we we really hold James in, in the highest of regard. Mm. So I'm so excited to uh, have him on. So before we go to James, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on with our journey home. Yeah, we've been really busy. I mean, trying to get this audio book out, my goodness, uh, another black comedy, unbelievable uh, stuff, hey? The trials and tribulations of your products are just insane however we persevere and we found a solution and its launch date was last week our universal journeys audiobook a fantastic compilation of all the work you've done coupled with the music of medwin goodall and tim rock yeah he's so, also he's from the uh, uh, a music group called threefold and that's who tim rock's involved with and you know, it's uh, it's really quite an honour to have two gentlemen of that calibre uh, wanting to contribute to this project. I mean, we're just absolutely thrilled. Yeah, and I just want to make a special mention to the audio book because some of us don't read. I'm one of them, yeah, and it puts me to sleep. But you know, there's something about the harmonics of your voice that really adds another layer, at least for me, and I'm sure for a lot of other people. So I just encourage people to go to ouruniversaljourney.com.au and you'll see the link to the audio book and you can download it straight away as an MP3, put it on your iPhone or your computer, listen to it on the way to work or just relax at home, turn the box off and, and just listen to the audio book. It's really worthwhile. Yeah, I'm not much of a reader, as people know, and I prefer an audio version personally, and that's why I put so much effort into it. It was a lot of work. People <laughs> probably don't realise just how much involved in, in the production of, of such a product, and uh, um, we're very happy with the outcome. It was a lot of work, a lot of hours went into it, and uh, very, very excited. Um, we've also got the documentary, or sh shall I really say, it's more like it's been called Our Journey Home, the movie, isn't it? It is. The, it's, it's a movie uh, in a documentary format. <laughs> That'd be the best way to explain it. Yeah. Uh, the new website will be up soon, uh, ourjourneyhomemovie.com.au. 
The actual DVD will not be available till later in November, maybe even early December, but it is almost finished. It's very exciting. Oh, yeah. That one's a good one. Took um, about a year and a half to film it. Oh, yeah. More. It's great. It's, it's yeah. It's, you know, I've been lucky enough to see the, the final cut. It hasn't had all the sounds and all the, uh, the credits put on it, but it's, Sean's done a terrific job. Sean Vanderberg has just done an amazing job with the documentary and movie, I should say. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think it's going to open the message that you present to a lot more people. Uh, it's it's a kind of milder uh, version than your book. It hasn't got as much detail, but it's um, it really captures the essence of what you've been sharing with humanity. And I think it's done a great job. Yeah, it does in a, in a more subtle way, in a, in, a, in a more gentle way. And uh, it's not going to be massively hard-hitting as some of our regular listeners um, you know, are accustomed to. It, uh, it is about reaching a wider audience. So it's a bit of a bridge. Oh, that's the way I see this uh, OJH, the movie. Is, it is a bridge to a wider, to reaching out to the wider community. Because um, there's so many people, they've, they've worked so hard and done the hard work within themselves and got into this place where they can understand this level of information. And it's it's really important that we now uh, have the ability to reach a, a much wider group than what we're currently uh, reaching. There's a, there's a lot more people that are now coming uh, out of waking up out of that trance and are really looking as true seekers to find out what's going on. And, uh, you know, to, to come out of the trance and just be confronted with my material, you know, first up, it's too confronting. It really freaks people out. It freaked me out. <laughs> I did the journey and I freaked you out. I did. And, and so it's, uh, I think this movie is a very good idea and, it, and it's functioning on a level that does help bridge the gap. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think it's time to invite James. All righty. Without further ado, we wish to welcome James Pask. Morning, guys. Thanks very much for having me. It's an honour and a pleasure, James. How are you going, James? Jason here. Very well, Jason. And yourself? Yeah, fantastic. It's been a bit rough the last couple of days, but uh, nothing like a dose of super woo radio to lift your spirits and (laughs) have some fun. It has been intense the last couple of days. Have, Have you noticed something there, James, as well? I have, yeah. I had uh, last few days has been uh, more challenging than than most, and I've also had a lot of friends and family and clients uh, ringing me and asking what's going on and saying that there was, uh, you know, definitely something in the air, and um, and there was a couple of earthquakes around the world, which um, always for those of us that are a bit more sensitive to Mother Earth's movements and so on, that can sometimes cause people to be out of sorts. Um, and then, of course, I think it was talking to you the other day, George, you said it felt like someone had turned the dial up on the matrix. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, it could have been any of those things, but certainly the last couple of days have been a bit challenging, that's for sure. Yeah, or a combination of things because they really do monitor the uh, the behaviour and the energetic patterns of Mother Earth because, you know, they want to control that. So I think that's kind of a symbiotic thing. Absolutely. Yeah, and for the listeners, we are recording this on Thursday, the 25th of October, just to put that in perspective in case you've been feeling the same symptoms. It's amazing how many people do. And, you know, it's important to share this sort of information because then people realise, you know, they're not alone and they're not going crazy in the way they feel, which cannot be explained, you know, through uh, contemporary, logical, rational sort of uh, thought processes. Um, no, there's, there's a lot going on. And there is an explanation to the way we feel. Absolutely, I agree. So, James, uh, let's get stuck into it, eh? Sure. Um, just so you know, Super Woo Radio is not like a traditional uh, podcast program. We see ourselves as three guys in a virtual pub, just having a chat, sharing a virtual, I suppose, cup of coffee this early in the morning or cup of tea. Uh, and we just want you to be raw and real, tell it how it is. And things could get a little controversial. Uh, and we just want you to share your experience and we all can agree to disagree on certain subjects. Uh, so I just want to preface our conversation a little bit. So let's sure. begin, yeah, so let's begin with, I suppose, your journey. Uh, I imagine you had a traditional Australian 
upbringing? I did, yes. I was uh, born in uh, Sydney, Australia, and raised in a uh, in a pretty strict Catholic family, actually, and uh, went to a Catholic school and used to go to Mass a fair bit. And uh, I would always sort of question and, and wonder why I should just believe what I was being told by, you know, a pretty elderly priest who was pretty boring and not very inspirational, I must say, and, uh, and school and getting told these stories. And I thought, well, you know, and then I also heard about these other religions out there in, in you know, outside of school, of course. Um, out of my curiosity, I used to read up on these things and, you know, heard about Buddhism and Muslim religion and um, all these other religions and beliefs around the world. And um, and so I left school and uh, I had a very strong curiosity for seeking the truth. And I've actually um, looked into many, many religions. I've been baptised as a Mormon. I have uh, was, of course, baptised as a Catholic. I've looked into Buddhism. I've joined the Church of Scientology. Um, I've pretty much at one stage looked into and, and, and thoroughly felt into a lot of the, the core beliefs and structures of a lot of the um, religions around the world and uh, basically came to a point where after going through a few different jobs and so on where um, I felt very disgruntled and disillusioned with what I was reading, what I was seeing around the world and and why people were fighting over, you know, their beliefs. And, and, and then I very much did a lot of history when I was at school as well, a lot of ancient history and modern history. And if you study those things, you can see very clearly the the impact um, that some of these religions and beliefs have had on the world. And, uh, you know, just the wars alone and, and some of the atrocities that have happened. And essentially it's just, uh, you know, our human family trying to... Um, you know, have something to believe in and have some sort of faith and some sort of hope. And it was very sad to me that um, in trying to do that, they uh, they would fight and all these different, you know, just on different beliefs about essentially the same sort of thing that they wanted to believe in and, and hope for. Yeah, I suppose in this um, epoch of amnesia, we have replaced our true core essence with uh, some sort of ideology presented to us by somebody else rather than having what we naturally have occurring deep within us absolutely absolutely and so on that journey i um i then uh came to a point where i uh was sort of i suppose hit rock bottom um as happens with a lot of people on this journey and and in doing so it forced me to really look within and, and probably question a lot of the things that i um believed in and i had some unusual experiences growing up i would um, had a, ha, have a lot of experiences of deja vu. I felt like I would know things before they were going to happen at times. Um, and I would, being a, a class captain at school a lot of the time in most years, and then being a vice captain of the school, I often would, and it being a Catholic school, I'd go to funerals probably seven or eight times a year, people I didn't know. And uh, and at these funerals, I just got the strangest sense of things. It was like a time where people were were quiet, their minds were quiet, and they were still. And you could really feel an, an energy off people, and you could and I could sort of hear and felt like at times I was hearing um, voices and and people trying to communicate. And so, of course, being in a Catholic background, that was all very much uh, frowned upon. And so I denied that and never really looked into that until later on in life, uh, hitting rock bottom. I then got introduced to a friend of mine who's, who had been doing a lot of psychic development and um, you know, spiritual healing and Reiki and so on and meditation. And I then studied with her for probably about seven or eight years. And at that point, I really did feel like I'd found my calling and found the answers um, and I got quite heavily involved in that for a long time until I then started even questioning that. And because what I noticed was essentially it was all the same characters and movie stars, but just they were all there. <laughs> so rather than having one person, whether it be Jesus or 
Muhammad or, you know, Archangel so and so, in the New Age movement that I was that I discovered, all the superstars were there and represented. And at the time I thought, Wow, that's so cool. You know, there's no one singular thing. Everyone's included. It's like one big party. This is fantastic. <laughs> and uh and that was great for a little while, but I found myself um questioning again that gnawing feeling that had been without me throughout the years of exploring all the religions started to come back and I would have explanations given to me. I'd read some of these channeled works and so on. And I just have these feelings of, is that, is that all, you know, I remember being in a, in a trance mediumship class and people were, you know, channeling through these beings from, you know, multidimensional universes and these supposedly beings that are just so wise and, and they would all essentially say the same thing, very airy-fairy and very fluffy. Mm. And I remember at the class saying, seriously, is that, is that all? That's all you got to say. You know, out of all the things you could tell us and bring through and the questions and all this sort of stuff, that's, you know, love and light and everything's going to be fine and all that sort of stuff. That's all you got to say. And that really made me question it and say, hang on, I feel like something's not quite right here. You know, what, what am I really being told here and, and who are these beings and what, what's going on? And I started to question and look around. And in fact, that's when I got introduced to your work, George, um, by a very good friend of mine. And, um, and then that started the whole process of then, and then looking within is what happened then. Um, I found your work, George, very empowering. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people at first, I think when they explore your work, at first they feel it's very in your face and you say, wow, okay, there's all this, all these things going out there in the world. But then with that, there's a massive sense of empowerment because rather than being saved by someone outside of ourselves, by an archangel or a centered master or whoever, we all of a sudden realize that we're the ones we've been waiting for. We're the ones that are here to save ourselves. And uh, that's, for, for a lot of time when you first explore that, it's scary and empowering at the same time. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for acknowledging that, James. I appreciate that. It is scary because what gets confronted is all the, all the programs we carry. <laughs> and That's we right. kind of, uh, we, we realise just how many we're carrying when we're confronted with this information and, uh, and, and the way this uh, information is presented. It's, um, yeah, it is confronting to, to realise just how, immersed in these programs we still are absolutely and james i find it so fascinating that your timeline is the same as mine and many listeners we start questioning the 3d paradigms the control systems around religion finances politics and many others and then we say well there's got to be more to it and isn't it funny how we get dragged into the more fourth dimensional paradigms so we get us we escape from one and then land into the the trappings of the next and that one is much more appealing i remember when i was meditating and i was doing a uh, a technique that was using uh sound waves and i'd go into the state of nothingness and i'd bliss out i would be so happy i'd be so ecstatic and nothing would go on it was complete stillness and it, all the yogis and all the uh, Eastern philosophers say, that's where, you, that's where you need to go. It's fantastic. You must be so happy. And I went, but there's nothing there. There's got to be more to it. That can't be it. And it's kind of like, you know, it's a different story to yours, but the same timeline where we get to a stage where we go, there's more to this. And then along comes George and you read the material that he shares and your world collapses. Mine did. I just went, oh, my goodness. And all the paradigms that I've been immersed in, all the programs that I've been subjected to were just smacked over my head like yeah. a ton of bricks. And uh, it takes a while to get through that. And then when you get through it, you realise that, hey, it's all within me. It's got nothing to do with George, absolutely nothing to do with him at all. And it's all about self-empowerment. And I just think the timeline and the story you shared and what I've experienced are, are so similar. And I think a lot of listeners, uh, I feel the same. So I just want to mm. share that. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, uh, it's amazing, really. It's, it's quite ingenious. Um, you know, there's, there's always people 
if you were looking at if, if you're from their point of view the, the powers that be if you like that are you know putting this sort of control and stuff over the planet if you imagine there are little groups of people that start to go hang on a minute and they're scratching their heads going hang on but you said this and that doesn't match up and hang on, i've got these feelings and so then they you know they, then they go hang on there's a few people you know starting to uh, cause unrest and starting to question things and they create the new age movement and then it's just you know it's that next level it's the same sort of thing it's another religion it's just a lot more free and and, and easy and um, it's allowing a lot of the old mysticism of, you know, the Judean Christian literature stuff to the Christian mysticism to come back through and a lot of the pagan things to come back through. But it's still the same, very much the same, um, same sort of uh, issues of control and disempowerment, isn't it? Yeah, I loved how you mentioned earlier about, you know, it's all the same characters. And it is, if people just take a step back and look at it. Yeah, and it is about disempowerment. It is very clever, very sophisticated how people are coerced into giving their power away. Well, let's move on to healing, shall we? Mm. A fantastic introduction there. I'd actually like to start with traditional medicine, if that's a convenient spot to start, kind of like back in the 3D world. And um, it's quite easy to trash traditional medicine, but I did work for New South Wales Health and met a lot of amazing doctors and nurses and people working in, in that industry. And there's a lot of good about traditional medicine. I know it's a control paradigm and we can get through all that, but if I chop my finger off today, I know where I'd be going. I'd be going straight to hospital to get it sewed back on. I wouldn't be going to some uh, healing, spiritual healer down the road and, and asking her to fix or him to fix my finger. So I, I want to acknowledge traditional medicine and while it has its uh, shortcomings, major shortcomings, which we're going to get into now. And George, I'd probably ask you the first question, if that's okay. Sure. For me, what happened with health in a Western society is we lost connection to who we are. And not only did we lose it, it frowns upon acknowledging it. And I think that's been the biggest problem with traditional medicine, um, failing to kind of integrate the other aspects of themselves and, and knowing that literally we can heal ourselves. Do you want to talk on that? Yeah, because um, the moment we have an injury, we become very vulnerable. We're in a very vulnerable state of being. We're in pain and, uh, and our defences are down and we become, we, we, we immerse ourselves into a state of desperation and, and dependency. And when we're in that state of being, when we're in those modes, uh, that's when we are just like putty in their hands. And that's why these systems of um, medicine have been created uh, to take a total advantage of that. Um, you know, this, this allopathic uh, system, uh, there are some good components to it. I, I, don't, I totally agree with what Jason said earlier. However, there is, um, if for every illness that occurs on the planet, there is the remedy for that uh, somewhere on the planet. That's the way this reality is created. That's the way just about every reality in the universe is created. So the natural environment and all the remedies that the natural environment has to offer seems to have been dismissed and replaced by a chemical-based system, uh, a synthetic-based system. So that's where I see the shortcomings of what we would call uh, Western medicine, I suppose. Yeah, I agree. Um, but if I have a headache, I still grab for the paracetamol um, to fix it. So it's interesting how we still we're still connected to uh, the Western side of things, despite our own spiritual growth and truth-seeking journey. Well, James, there, sorry. There's Go other ahead. alternatives to you know you can take for headaches. Um, I'm I'm using them now, um, not as in this moment, um, but yeah, I was using Western medicine up until recently, and now there's a. There's something I've come across which works. And um, so there are alternatives. We're just not aware of the alternatives. Yeah, and James, I was going to ask you, we'll use the headache pills or headache uh, treatments as an example. Western well, medicine has techniques that work fairly quickly. Yes. Um, and we're a society where everything's moving fast. We haven't got any free time. So we're kind of addicted to this instant, I'm going to say gratification, which is probably the wrong word, but... 
there is a bit of gratifying about it. It's like my problem's fixed instantly. And traditional techniques and natural medicines tend to take a lot longer. Do you want to speak on that? Um, in, in some cases, they do take longer. But to look at the headache example, um, you can, you know, you can cure a headache just as quick as uh, or quicker if than than any magic pill and. A headache's a really interesting one because the main 99% of the time a headache is due to dehydration because what happens is you've got a certain amount of water in the brain and that's essential for your life and if it and it's supposed to be replaced every 24 hours that water in the brain but because we're all drinking coffees and not drinking enough water and where most of us are walking around chronically dehydrated and so what the brain does to survive is it actually ratchets down and holds on to that water in your brain and that ratcheting down and compression to hold on to that water is what a headache is. And so you can very quickly alleviate the headache symptoms by drinking a litre of water, using some, some peppermint essential oil on your temples and the back of your neck, and also just holding those little nodules at the base of your, the base of your head and the top of your neck and putting some pressure on there, and that just helps alleviate that ratcheting tension in the back of your neck. And, uh, and the dehydration, and, and in about 15 minutes, you'll find probably about 95% of the time your headache will, will disperse. Um, and then if you look at the energetic side of it, you concentrate on focusing on the energy, and, and because that's all pain is, is trapped energy, you focus on it where it is, and you imagine blowing it off and blowing out of your energetic field or your torus field, and then, instead, and then you then focus on where the pain was, and with your intention, you notice the free-flowing kinetic energy moving throughout your body. And if you do some techniques like that, you can find most pain will uh, will disperse within about 15 minutes. Wow. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. And I, I think that's one of the key things is it's just a, it's not, it's a lack of awareness. Yeah. You know, the allopathic medicine has been, and I would agree totally, Jason, I would have died several times if it wasn't for modern medicine. I used to be very, very sick with asthma as a child growing up. And uh, and went to hospital several times and, and would not be here if it wasn't for you know Ventolin and you know about ten other drugs and steroids and all the rest of it, and it was in that sickness because of the the side on effects that had on my immune system, um, is why I got into into natural medicine in the first place and and how do I heal my body without having to take these drugs, that sent me off the Richter. You know, just the feelings were just shocking. I felt like I was going crazy on some of those drugs. And I started to treat myself naturally. And now if I ever look like that I'm getting a cold and potentially if, if left asthma coming on, there's then very specific juices and herbs and energetic things you do that, you know, it's a mind, body, spirit and earth connection approach to alleviating um, any trapped energy or dis at ease in the body. Mm, fantastic. I um, I don't know if it's uh, appropriate to go there yet, but I'm itching to get to this point in the conversation. And um, for me, I want to talk about big pharma a little bit. And um, are you ready to go there, Joe? Are you ready to take this to that level? Oh, yeah, that's what we're here for. We're going to go further yeah. than big pharma, but let's start with the 3D. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, we're going to go a lot further than big pharma. But uh, yeah, so I have been really having a good look at this lately uh, for a few months now. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm totally see it for what it is. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm convinced. I'm going to say I know. <laughs> I know it's a big, um, big statement to make. But the collaboration of the food industry with Big Pharma, mm. they are totally interwoven and connected. They're totally in collaboration with one another simply because Big Pharma is influencing the food industry in a way to um, give us the foods which are going to create the conditions which then create the dependency on the drugs Big Pharma have to give us. So it's a um, it's two major components of entrapping us within a cycle of dependency. So we depend they, they want to make us dependent on the foods that they're going to give us so we can't grow our own foods which are good for us. So we have to go to the supermarkets and get the food that the system wants to give us which then creates the conditions in our bodies, the illnesses and, and, and what have you, which then makes us dependent on the pharmaceutical companies. How do you feel about that? Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, if you look at the major shareholders in some of these main companies, um, of the soft drink companies and the, the fast food companies and so on, 
you'll see, and they, they use different holding names and so on, but you'll see if you do some research, that basically it boils down to, uh, you know, the Super 12 big companies um, that pretty much own or have subsidies, you know, large shareholdings in, in those different things. And you're exactly right, George. They create the problem and then they offer you the, the solution. And it's really interesting when you look back at how this all developed because, you know, natural medicine, um, and it's coming back into um, more popularity now, but at the turn of the century, there was, you know, there was only a few known diseases and there was about 10 or 11 whole food natural remedies for those things. And, and then lots of, you know, wives' tales and grandmother's solutions around that as well. And since then, you basically got to a point where, you know, the, German, the Germans got paid by the US government to come over and do a study on the American soil to find out what's wrong with it. They did the study in two weeks, and the conclusion was that the soil in America sucks. There's no nutrients in it. It's all washed out and sitting at the bottom of the rivers, and we need to put the big three chemicals on the soil in the fertilizer to put any sort of nutrition back in the in the soil. Um, and if you sp speak to modern day soil experts, that is fundamentally flawed. And the research shows there's over 20,000 different species of soil. And each different species of soil likes to grow different things. Wow, this is awesome. See, this is this is why we're interviewing you, James. Keep going, mate. This is unbelievable stuff. Well, there's places in the world where um, certain cacti will only grow in one tiny little area in the world, in the desert. And you try and grow that anywhere else in the world, it won't work. You can have tomatoes in your backyard, you can have them in the front of the yard, and they won't do very well, but you take them on the other side of the yard and they'll grow perfectly well. You know, And then um, it's really interesting because then what happens is plants and stuff, then um, they're putting out a vibration. And that vibration is one of sadness, the soil doesn't work, want me here. We're not a good match, you know. And so it then puts out this frequency of I'm not happy. And so then the bugs and the birds and everything else does their job to right. come and then take that poor plant out of its misery so it can then grow where it's supposed to grow with the right match of soil. But in our human wisdom, we like to get in a fight with everything. So then we spray things and we do things to kill the bugs, keep the birds away and keep that plant going, put chemicals on it, and we're going to force it and make it happen. And again, it's this lack of awareness about the different species of soil, the different textures and colours and smells and where things like to grow in different seasons and cycles of the moon and the sun. And, and there's so many different things that, you know, beautiful information that we once had that has been lost intentionally over the years, unfortunately, through a lot of book burnings at the Library of Alexandria and many, many others where a lot of this information was stored and was intentionally uh, burnt. And then we obviously got sent in the into sort of darker and middle ages times. You know, I can I can so relate to that because uh, where I live is, um, you know, we've reclaimed a piece of uh, cropping and grazing land, and it's been the land has just been raped here like crazy, and uh, it's taken a couple of years. But the, we've got some native grasses that have popped up around the place in certain areas, and when you go and stand there, you can feel the energy is different to to the rest of the the, the paddock. Uh, or the field, or whatever you want to call it. And I said to Cynthia, "That's the land is telling us this is where we should start planting a little grove of, of native trees, you know, because this is where the, the land is starting to regenerate itself back here in this spot here. And you can, when you start talking with the land, and and you can feel the the difference in the energetic patterns where these little native grasses are coming out compared to the other areas. It really is noticeable. Absolutely. Yeah. And so and. And with with that, you know, you're exactly right. So the, the soil there is, it, the life underneath that soil is is in working in harmony with that and it's coming back. Mm. And so, and this is where, you know, Big Pharma came in, you know. It sees, they came over here and that's where the Big Pharma started. Big Pharma comes from um, Nazi Germany and that whole deal that went over there, which with, in some research, when you look at that was actually sponsored by and paid for by the Vatican was the start of the big you know, farmer. I'm, I'm going to say I totally agree with that. In in my understandings of the way things played out, I totally agree with that. And that might be a bit shocking for some, but that is what the, uh, if you do some research into it, that's what it shows. And from that, you had a time where uh, Hitler in the concentration camps had an open slather to do all these different experiments. And that's when they got 
a lot of their toxicology readings from with different drugs and so on and they knew how much they could give people before they had terrible side effects and even death and so the german companies came and you know got paid by the u.s government to tell them that the soil's terrible and they need to put their chemicals and fertilizer all over the soil it then became illegal for you to have a farm without putting the the three big chemicals on your soil and so then this started this whole thing of uh depleted food you know um on one hand and then all of a sudden what do you know a couple of couple of years later they come out with pills <laughs> to make up for the depletion in the soil so they take away um the natural food and then they come up with a solution you know and that's pharmaceutical industry but then the, the supplement industry is not too much different you know um and um it, it's it's shocking to see such a thing happen because it's all about um, making money and control. That's why natural medicine's never really um, taken off in, in, in our modern day times is because you can't patent it. Monsanto is working very hard to change that <laughs> with the Terminator gene and so on. But at the moment, you can't patent a tomato and, and all those sorts of things. And there's no money in it. There's no money in telling someone to go and you know, eat some carrots to make their eyes better and do all these different natural things. But they can some of the markups they have on some of these pharmaceutical drugs are just absolutely incredible. And it's becoming more and more um, something that's becoming more and more realized by people. And there's some quotes now out there floating around from some very leading physicians. Um, the head of medicine at Harvard University was um, quoted as saying at a, at a press conference that you could take all the drugs in the world and throw them in the ocean. It'd be terrible for the fish but it'd probably be fantastic for human beings. Wow. And uh, that's, that's just a... I nearly fell off my chair when I heard, you know, the head of medicine at Harvard University saying such a thing. But it's just really gotten out of control. You know, there's now... Um, you know, there's now over 10,000 different labelled diseases that are all named with ancient Latin that no one can understand. It creates mystery around it, you know? Yeah. The less we understand about it, the more, you know open to their suggestions and stuff we are. And then they come out with all these drugs for one of those things. There's over 500,000 different painted drugs for over 10,000 different diseases, each with their own funding, research grants, um, you name it. It is huge, huge business, massive. That's the key behind it all, isn't it? It's the um, the business enterprise of it. It's, the, it's turning the planet and turning the health industry into the corporatized uh, infrastructure. Um, and that's what humanity is being assimilated into is uh, a planetary corporation. And now they want to be, assimilate humanity into a uh, galactic and cosmic corporation. But uh, that's another subject for another day, which we have discussed previously as well. Well, later on in, the, in, the, in this interview, we'll, uh, we'll get into that realm. Sure. So um, I want to ask you a very, very big question now. You have a very deep and intimate understanding of cancer. Um, this is a really, really big subject. And uh, I would really love to hear your take on cancer because we generally, the, the overwhelming majority of people understand it from what they're being told through traditional sources of information, being the, the media, the World Health Organization, all its um, ancillaries and, and what have you. So Please share with us your insights on cancer. Sure. Well, the fantastic thing about words is if you do do some research on why things are called certain things and the history behind words, it can show you so much. And cancer comes of the word cancor. And cancor means rot and decay. And essentially, that is what cancer is. It's a, it's a rot and decay in the body. And it's it's a really interesting thing because if you go back to... Um, the turn of well, 1900, cancer was one in 8,000 people had cancer, and they used to call it wasting disease. Mm. And often people say to me, "Well, how would they know back then? They didn't have, you know, they didn't have the modern technology to do things." And that is actually incorrect. The way they actually looked at post-mortem things back then was very, very advanced, and they did a lot of a lot more than they do now. They really investigated um, what took place. So it wasn't the fact that the cancer wasn't detected. It was just that it was nowhere near as prevalent. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
and that's you know if you look back at 1900s the, the fresh food the fresh air you know no none of the modern day technology the wireless internet and wi-fi uh the foodless foods lifeless drinks you know all these things that contribute um to to cancer and so cancer is really um essentially rotten decay in the body and if you can imagine if you don't brush your teeth for a few days and you get that you get that white plaque around your teeth yeah and what cancer is is essentially this dark thick viscous fluidium in the body that is going to certain areas and stopping the normal cells from doing their normal job and this thick viscous fluidium is from you know like we've been talking about the different drugs the residues of drugs build up in the body and so for example you know you might have a headache and you take a simple headache pill you don't think much much of it and yeah it can dull the pain but there's a residue that toxic residue it's not normal the body is built to synthesize uh, life and light and what it comes down to is is nutrition what you put in your food so in your mouth so the word nutrition it gets broken down into two words new and trition and the word new means light and the word trition means process of so nutrition is the process of light mm. and the cells of our body don't actually eat anything the fundamental science is flawed our cells don't assimilate and they don't eat what takes place is a very similar thing to what happens on the earth and we, we always hear these sayings that we're the micro of the macrocosm and that's absolutely true so we're supposed to eat foods that are alive you know if you take a vitamin c pill or a lipitor you plant it in the ground and you water it, put fertilizer on it, nothing's going to happen. Whereas you get the seed of an orange, you put it in the ground and a massive tree is going to grow. And that life force, that creative spark, is what our body lives off and thrives off, mm. that electric, electric, electricity. And that's what we're supposed to be eating. And then the other thing that gives us life force, of course, is, is positive thoughts, beautiful loving emotions, connection with the earth, that energy that permeates from Mother Earth. All these things that, if you look at modern day society, have been taken away from us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're told not to go out in the sun because it's bad for our health. We're told, you know, we're all indoors, we're wearing shoes, we're not connecting to the life force of the Mother Earth. The foods we're eating are, are, are eating are depleted, and we've got chemicals and herbicides and pesticides and grown in soil that's deficient. Uh, the, the drinks and things we're putting in, you know, there's fluoride in our water, electromagnetic radiation coming off all sorts of cell phones and wireless towers and all that sort of stuff is cancer causing. If you look at the research into this stuff, that is what the research is showing. And it puts internal stress on the, on the, uh, on the organs for a lot of this Wi-Fi. And you've got modern day lifestyle. We're so busy these days. We don't have any time to really have proper connections with ourselves, our loved ones, the earth. We just don't. And so all these things combined essentially is what causes this thick viscous fluidium in the body because emotions create chemical reactions in the body if you have an emotion of stress and anger that creates a chemical reaction in the body that creates some of this thick viscous fluidium that's just as real as and impactful on you as if you're drinking a can of coke wow. and so these stresses and foods and different things that go on negative thoughts and traumas that are trapped in our body from either this life, past lives, or our ancestors, all combine to make like a plaque, just like you have on your teeth if you don't brush your teeth after a while. And that plaque then goes around to different parts of the body where you have a genetic weakness. Um, and then that fluidium then causes disease and problems in that area. So the qu a question I'd like to pose to you, does everyone have cancer in them? Like, do we all have it uh, and our bodies cope with it? on a regular basis in different ways or that's that's exactly right my understanding is and what some of the research shows is that that's exactly right we all have cancer at different times because we all have all these modern day stresses and so on um and we might have some you know negative thoughts and that sort of thing but then what happens is our immune system kicks in you know you, you you get home and you see the wife and the kids and you go out into the garden and all of a sudden all those stresses and 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 all those different things get transmuted you know, wow. and so the cancer gets held at bay and your immune system is strong enough to cope with it. You know, that's a really big deal because we're led to believe that, uh, you know, you haven't got it and then all of a sudden someone gets it and they go, oh, you've got cancer, you know. And that's the way it's presented to um, into the psyche of, of the public arena. 
in the psyche of the people. And so to know that we all have it and we all deal with it on a regular basis, and it's only that it takes over people under certain conditions and certain circumstances, that's that's a real big one. It is. It's huge. And, and you know, it's a, it's a real, it's the number, number two killer in the world at the moment. Um, and it's a it's a really big one, you know. Heart disease is number one, and depression, according to some of the research, is going to be the number one killer by 2020. Really? And uh, that's you know this the increased interference interdimensionally and multidimensionally is has got a lot to do with that. And I'm sure we'll get into that a bit later. But oh yeah, we're going to get right into that. But uh, just for now, I would like to read a quote out by somebody, um, and it has to do with a substance that can be so easily created um, and has the ability to kill cancer. And I'm going to explain, read out why. It's only a short paragraph, so it goes like this. It has to do with hemp oil. Now, hemp oil contains can cannabinoids. Now, when these cannabinoids, when they enter our bodies, um, these particular ones are hemp oil cannabinoids, they are absorbed by our endocannabinoid system through CB1 and CB2 receptors. Now, the endocannabinoid system regulates most functions in our bodies, including our immune system. This means that hemp oil cannabinoids can work on a range of conditions. Our bodies produce natural cannabinoids called amandamides. But when our immune systems become compromised, for example, through the use of antibiotics, as just one example, it leaves the door open for cancer cells to develop. And if the cancer starts to become well developed, then our immune system cannot overcome it. But amazingly, these cannabinoids, if they are decarboxylated, they fit the cannabinoid receptors. Now, when these cannabinoids go into these receptors, they cause the buildup of a fat molecule called ceramide. Here's the key. Now, when ceramide comes into contact with cancer cells, it kills them and does no harm to healthy cells. End quote, Rick Simpson. So for me, that's a biggie. I don't know if you know about that. Yeah, no, hemp oil, hemp oil is um, definitely something that is fantastic for treating all sorts of um, conditions in the body. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you can certainly target, um, I mean, cancers all over are generally the same thing, but depending on what kind of cancer you have and where it is in the body, you would use different methods of treating it. Like, for example, some in some circumstances, a lot of uh, whole foods and fasting um, and, and detoxing and getting rid of, because if you imagine that thick sludge and that toxic fluidium needs to be drained out of the body, you know, often we get uh, lumps and we freak out and go and get them cut out and then the body goes hang on a minute what have you just done I just built a garbage disposal unit to store this thick viscous fluidium and stop it from going to your um, important organs to keep you alive and you've gone and cut it out so then the body goes and builds 20 more just in case and then we look at it and we say oh my god the cancer's spreading let's let's uh, you know get on the chemo and then all this sort of stuff and you're absolutely correct, George. I agree with that quote. If you use things like hemp oil to reduce the inflammation in the body and to target the cancer cells, and there's a lot of very, very powerful uh, ways of doing that as well. Um, you know, baking soda, high doses of vitamin C, for example, um, intravenously. You look at some of the fantastic things like ellagic acid from raspberries that does the same thing, kills, targets and kills the cancer cells. Apricot kernels. Apricot kernels, uh, the B17 uh, vitamin. There's so many different ways of doing this, but essentially what you're doing is you're, if you've got like a, you know, if you imagine a glass and it's got this thick, you know, oil in it, you know, this black dark oil, and the goal is to empty the oil out and then clean the glass up so that you can put nice fresh water and have that flow. Because essentially we're just a whole big system of tubes. We're tubular beings. Our organs are just a gathering or a plexi of tubes. And so there's only a certain number of things that can go wrong with tubes. They can be cut, they can be ballooned and burst like an aneurysm, or they become clogged. And 95% of all disease is clogged tubes. And what's clogging the tubes is this thick, viscous fluidium. And so by detoxing and cleansing the body and then targeting certain areas of the body with specific foods, uh, such as the hemp oil and allergic acid, all those other things, you can 
you can certainly um, get on top of the cancer and basically get your immune system um, doing what it should do. And there's so many things that have been put into our society to compromise our immune system. And it's just beyond a joke. The electromagnetic radiation that's compromising our immune systems, the stress, the things you're seeing on television that keep you in fight and flight. There's always this depressing news in the, in the, in the media. All these different things, the foods, the drinks, you know, the chemicals, it just constantly is bombarding our immune system. And there's so much you can do to change that. There really is. And, and turn that around and have your immune system strong and working for you and keeping your health, your health and your body in, a, in good shape. Yeah, this, um, this method of hemp oil that Rick Simpson's come up with is treated over 5,000 people and has had uh, uh, somewhere around 95 to 99% success rate. So I think that um, speaks for itself. That is the highest success rate I've ever heard of any natural treatment. It is the highest, it is the highest uh, success rate. And uh, if you look into his story, it's uh, really quite interesting and fascinating. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he's come out of Canada. And um, yeah, anyway, moving on. Um, Jay, have you got a question there for James? Uh, I don't want to comment on your statistics there. I'd be very careful to uh, read what a self-proclaimed uh, treatment person says about success rate. I've seen others do that, and when it's looked at from a more analytical, scientific point of view, um, the numbers don't always stack up. I'm not saying hemp oil is not good. I'm just saying don't pin your, pin your hopes on one thing. Uh, cancer can be cured by a number of things. Temperature is the latest one that's getting a lot of publicity, bringing your core body temperature up to as high as you can stand for as long as you can. Apparently, it's a great technique. Um, so we just need to be open about all different possibilities and I usually find for the cancer treatments that I've seen being most successful uh, a combination of strategies hitting it all at once. So I just want to leave you with that little thought. Um, one little question before I want to move on to a new topic um, related to cancer and illness. You know in the, the saying, if you eat an apple a day, it keeps the doctor away. And my understanding about that saying is it's the apple seed and the ingestion of the apple seed. It's the most critical part to that saying. Do you know anything about that, James? Um, yeah, it's really interesting. The apple a day, that actually came, there's a saying that, that an ancient Asean group of people um, and the, the leaders of the town would send out two apples to everyone's porch um, and it was your job as part of your daily ritual was to have, have your um, two apples a day. And that's where the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. The apple is it's one of the most amazing superfoods on the planet. It represents, it's the sphere. So you've got the circle, the sphere, but you've also got a five-pointed star within the sphere. So it's a very, very special food, and it targets all systems of the body at a cellular level and all throughout your entire body. Apples are just fantastic. And you're exactly right, the seeds and even the core mm -hmm. as well. It's very, yeah. very nutritious. Yeah, I heard the core's got a, um, a small, tiny dosage of arsenic in it. That's right. And, and what this does is the seeds in the core, like, for example, if someone's got a lot of heavy metals in their body and, and it's gone through and crossed the blood brain barrier and gone into the brain, if you have four apples and you eat the seeds in the core and everything, and you do that for about 90 days, that'll help to remove a lot of the heavy metal poisoning in your body, mercury and different things like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. I'd like to just focus on a, a subject relating to, you can call, we can use the cancer theme, and I've got an example that I was involved in, and that's thought and emotion. We've been talking a lot about physical substance so far in this interview. And for me, thought and emotion is a really important aspect of um, well-being and obviously illness. And the example I'd like to give, uh, in my earlier years, I worked in environmental health, the impact of environmental toxins on, on human health. And we used to get different clusters. In this case, it was a cancer cluster that we investigated. And it was breast cancer in a group of women working in a, uh, I'll just say a studio, close to a lot of electromagnetic radiation. I mean, right on top of it, right next to it. And there were three women who had developed breast cancer working in the same company. 
And then within three months, there were five and then 10. And this cluster kept getting bigger and bigger. And we go out and measure the electromagnetic radiation and, and sure it was there, but there was no more there, in fact, less than there was on neighbouring floors and even neighbouring buildings. So they had the same environmental exposure and yet we had this cluster forming in this particular workplace. And when I was talking and interviewing some of the women, I just said, what do you guys do on your breaks? Just to see if they were going somewhere else. They said, oh, no, we just talk about Jane and she had this problem and now she's got this and they'd be all full of worry and concern. And they'd all sit around and natter about the breast cancer and how bad it is and how they're all going to get it and they're all going to be sick. And I was just wondering, James, if you could um, comment on the ability for people to manifest illness just through thought and emotion. Absolutely. I think that's that kind of study is so interesting. It's awesome that you got to do something like that. That's just fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I agree totally. I think, um, you know, some people, you know, and this is the, where the whole placebo thing comes in and, um, you know, the, the very fact that one of them uh, got sick and then they were all talking about that and then just through their beliefs, beliefs are very, very powerful and um, and they open themselves up. They said, you know, they're capturing um, energy through their thought. They're taking that free-flowing kinetic energy that's out there in the universe and it's potential potentiality and all of a sudden through their thoughts they're now capturing that energy and bringing it in as potential energy and all of a sudden they start to add those thoughts with some feelings and emotion behind it and that's really really powerful because the thoughts are one thing and they capture energy and it becomes potential but then when you put the feelings and emotion behind it the heart as an organ is the most powerful magnetic organ in the entire body and it sends a lot more information to the brain than the brain does to the heart yeah, so all of a sudden you've got the thoughts capturing the potential energy. And as soon as you engage the heart center and that feeling and emotion goes in there, wow, that's, that's manifesting things to you. And that depends on your thoughts and beliefs, whether that's a positive or a negative thing. So you might have a guy, for example, who just went, oh, that's ridiculous, that electric man, that's not going to get me. That's just, you know, and then he just, he just repels that away from his belief and his thoughts and that magnetism, you know, how magnets sometimes when you push them together, they repel each other. And then other people, for instance, those women who were um, talking about that at lunch and giving that that energy and focus and sadness and through empathy, they're also lowering their um, their Taurus field and their, their aura and energetic field. And so they're allowing those things to actually impact them and actually through their free will and choice in a way by talking about that and how they're all going to get it, they're allowing that stuff to come in and affect them. So would you say the thought processes and the projected feelings, uh, emotions and beliefs um, then go about creating the energetic environment for these diseases to um, proliferate? That's right. Yes, I do. And I think any one of those things on their own, yes, that can happen. But it's when you combine all these different things we've been talking about, you know, the foods and the and the stresses and electromagnetic and the thoughts and the feelings, it's all those things. That's why it's a mind, body, spirit and earth connection approach to any sort of healing because, you know, they're all equally as powerful at, at creating um, disease or, or health in the body. Wow. I think it's fantastic. Um, I'd like to explore thought and shamanism and techniques used in healing in the second hour at great length and we'll build it right up to the super wheel level. But George, looking at my clock, it seems it's probably time for a, a break. The first hour is near the end. Is there anything else you want to share before the break? Um, for me personally, I, I've just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. I'm still enjoying this conversation. Um, we're going to really get into some deeper stuff and if we haven't already and, uh, yeah, I just want to have a comment back on that hemp oil when I talked about that. And I love your comments, Jay, because, you know, we, uh, we, we counterbalance one another so beautifully. And with the hemp oil, it's really, really important that people understand it's not just your average everyday hemp oil that I was referring to. It's a specific type which is extracted from the plant in a specific way. And um, that's that's the one that's doing the um, the having the greatest effect. So... Um, be very, very careful, like Jason said, when we discuss these sorts of issues and, and we get sort of like a little bit passionate and could even get carried away about certain things and 
get blinded by our yearning and our aching because there's so many people out there who are trying to present something, you know, they've got good intentions and they really want to help. Uh, but a lot of things just don't have the effect that some people believe that it should have. And I've been, I've experienced that myself, having gone through my conditions of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and, and certain other things I've had to endure within my life. And Jason's had an incredible journey too with his mum um, in helping to find uh, things to do with his mum and like cures and, and just remedies or just something to relieve the, the symptoms. And that's what I want to get into in the next hour too because you've had quite a journey there, Jason, with that sort of thing. Um, so we'll take a break. And James, is there anything else you'd like to add in this genre before we take a break and, and go into the next level? Yeah, if I could just add in there, uh, like with the hemp oil as, as being a treatment, there's also um, something I, I feel like I should add in there as well. There's a, a system called Gerson, Gerson Therapy, um, which is derived from a, a scientist called Max Gerson, who presented to the US Senate in about the 1940s, you know, 50 different cases of curing cancer using this Gerson therapy, which is organic juices, very specific diets, um, coffee enemas to detox the body and so on. And there's, there's clinics, doctor supervised clinics in Mexico and Japan. And I think there's a couple others around the world where people, if they do have cancer, they can go there and they can get doctor supervised and get treated. And they've got a very, very high success rate. And unfortunately, what happened to Max Gerson is he, uh, uh, the radio announcer, announced on radio that uh, you know they pretty much found a, a very, very good cure for cancer. And uh, the next day, that guy on uh, the ABC radio was fired. And within a couple of months after that, Max Gerson was um, became very, very ill. And when he looked into it, he'd been um, given some sort of poison. So. Um, Basically, do your research into these. There's so many different theories if you do some research. There's a very, very good movie called Wake Up, Cancer is Curable Now, which is a great place to start. But if you do your research, there's so many different ways of treating cancer. And like we've been talking about, it's so important to look at the mind, the body, and the emotions and the connection to the Earth Mother as a way of healing. Because unless you've got all those, you're not really guaranteeing yourself of, of healing. To give you an example, I used to put clients when I used to be, my journey started off with really looking at the food side of things and I'd put people on a specific diet and that would alleviate and help someone come back into balance with that kind of cancer, for example, prostate cancer. Then I'd put another person on exactly the same diet, but theirs wouldn't transmute. And I'd think, what's going on here? And that's what led me to understand that, hang on, well, there's a whole lot of other reasons why this person's hanging on to that disease. And that's where the, the mind and the, the emotions and so on come into it. Um, so I just wanted to add that in there just to, to give people an idea if they did have or knew of loved ones or friends that were suffering a condition like that, there's just so much they can look into and, and to embark on a journey of healing. So James, just before we head off to the break, could you please share with us your information? Where can people find you and uh, find out more about James Pask and what he does? Sure, they can uh, visit uh, my website, which is www resonate which is r-e-z-i-n-a-t-e dot com dot au and uh, there's a whole bunch of information on there about different um, services and different things we offer and do and they can contact me through there if they want to ask any questions um, and uh, we obviously do sessions locally but also do distance uh, skype phone sessions and even distant healing sessions so um, but all the information is on the website resonate dot com dot au fantastic thanks james Pleasure. That's brilliant. We'll be back after this short break and some shameless in house promotions. See you soon. what's really happening on planet Earth? Who are we? Where did we come from? And are we alone in the universe? Imagine if all we were told was a lie. 
I know about the illusion, I know about the lies being imposed on the human race. I know about it, and I'm here to expose them, and I will. Throughout history, we have been in contact with extraterrestrial races. The crop circles are attracted to the ancient sites, and wherever you get an ancient site, you tend to get a, a lot of crop circles. The light that descends from the sky affects each individual plant, makes it lay over, and it does it in three milliseconds. Mother Earth is a living being. The Earth has a force and a consciousness. There's been an agenda to actually manipulate the energetic lines of the planet. There was a lot of secrecy that was that was used to take the power away from people. They are frightened of people knowing this piece of information. This is underneath the Vatican here. The question to ask now is who's running religion? Seriously. We cannot continue to don't respect the earth, the nature, the environment. Mother Earth is not happy with the way that we're treating her. Change. We all have to change. It's time to change for the better. Every time you need to interact with another human being, just come from a place of empathy and compassion. Come from a place of love, and you'll be riding that wave of change. It's time to discover the truth. There is a much bigger purpose to you being here. You are very important. For us to be able to save this planet, we have to think much broader as a whole family, holistically. It's time to recognize who we are. This is the core to self-empowerment. This is understanding that nothing has it over you anymore. Finished. Game over. Free. I'm free. It's time to begin our journey home. It's good to have you on, look. It's good to be back home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's real good. Our journey home. The documentary coming soon. Our journey home movie.com.au Welcome back, everybody, to episode number four, Super Woo Radio. We have today with us James Past. And uh, James, in this uh, second hour, we're really getting into some juicy stuff. So I suppose I, um, uh, you know, I've had a lot of experiences to do with healings, being having done healings myself, and uh, I suppose wore, wore the hat of a healer for one stage in my life. And I've done Reiki and, and had my own techniques blended in with that so i just wanted to um probably hand it over to jay because he's got he's got a quite a good question for you in regards to this sort of area james i'd like to go through a few different healing techniques and we kind of get bigger and more weirder as we go along but i think a good transition from nutrition and food and and cancer would be over to the ancient healing system of shaman, our ancient uh, Aboriginal uh, people in Australia, the Indians in, in North and South America and, and many of the older cultures throughout the world. And the shamans that I had the pleasure to work with lived in Papua New Guinea. And what I noticed with them was their close connection with the elemental kingdom, um, the ability to communicate readily with, with rock, water, trees, but the technique I found most interesting from the shaman that I work with was the power of thought. 
and, and they would choose usually a, a plant or uh, a mineral and they would focus clear intent on this particular substance and then use that substance with embedded healing energies or healing thoughts that they put into it to do their work. And it was just amazing to watch some of the things they could do. Do you want to share any stories about shamanism and, and the power of uh, thought? Sure. Yeah, no, it is an amazing, uh, the basic premise of shamanism is that they understand that everything's alive, you know, absolutely everything's alive. And, and you know, if you look at even, and even the plant kingdom, um, and over the years, of course, um, before modern medicine, there's these indigenous cultures have gone through and worked out what specific plants target certain areas of the body and a and are good to give to someone for certain um, diseases or certain problems. And it's this understanding um, and this symbiotic relationship with, with nature that, uh, that is just so fundamental in, in any kind of healing and something that these indigenous shamans fully understood. Um, but I also think they understood, like you're saying, the power of thought. And again, it goes back to this mind, body, spirit and earth um, understanding of, of healing and uh, very much so I mean you can talk to you know the, the cells of your body and ask you know if you've got a pain in the foot ask you know the cells of your foot what's going on what do I need to look at here <laughs> um, and ask them to, to heal and return to their perfect um, perfect form and it's just amazing normally when someone's got a f bad foot they go oh bloody foot you know and they curse it and they, you know, <laughs> send negative energy at it. And that's what these shamans understand, that everything's alive and can therefore can be communicated with. And whether it's an animal or plant, um, a rock, and, um, and if you understand what aspects of these different plants or things can heal, you can communicate and then add to the healing benefits of that by through your positive intention and thought. So, for example... Um, you know, you might take a specific food, um, like for example, in nature, every single part of our body, every system of our body has its signature in nature. And this is how ancient cultures knew that certain things were good as an offering. It's called the doctrine of signatures. Mm. And so you look at a carrot and you slice a carrot side on, it literally looks like a pupil with radiating lines. It looks like the human eye. And as we know, you know, through science, modern science, that carrots are good for the eyes. And look at the avocado, the ancient Mayans and Incans used to offer the avocado as an offering to the females for any reproductive uh, problems, to prevent detentions in the womb, um, balance female hormones, and to get that area ready for birth. And if you talk to an avocado grower, it takes exactly nine months to ripen to full fruit. And, uh, and same with a walnut. You've got the hard skull on the outside, you open it up, you've got left and right hemisphere of the brain. Um, and walnuts are absolute brain food and so these indigenous cultures did have and still do have luckily an understanding that is just so precious and you can offer and then you back that those targeted healing nutrients in those plants you back that up with your intention such a powerful universal law the law of intention behind that and if you also have the person who's being healed having that same intention and belief that is one of the key things that's what works so well Part of the problem in modern day society is that, you know, you can take someone who is from that culture and take them to a shaman and they will have a lot of the times a lot better results than someone who is from, you know, modern day living, doesn't believe in any of that stuff. And purely because of the belief and the two universes, two spirits sitting there together in harmony with the similar beliefs, similar intention and working with that plant community and having that connection understanding the things that can be accomplished when that's in synergistic uh, working together is just so powerful. James, I could listen to you for hours. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it great? Like, because we've heard so many people talk about these concepts, and you explain it in such a simplistic way for people to understand. That's the magic that's going on here. Thanks, James. Pleasure. We need to we, we need to move on, mm. and um, let's go to your healing. Um, techniques. I know you've been through quite a few, James, but uh, I'd like you to share with the listeners where you started and, and where your technique has evolved to now. 
Well, it all started for me in the uh, the treating the body with with whole foods to to target different areas and healing. And then I found that, um, like I was explaining before, is that certain people with exactly the same ailment, the treatments would work on some people and not work on others. And then I sort of looked further into it and realized there was the whole the mind uh, and and the emotions and the connection with the earth or lack of connection with the earth and father, son and the cosmos and an understanding of all these other areas that come into um, creating dis or in the body. And so I started with that. Then I moved on to... Um, doing um, psychic development um, courses and I did uh, studied all the different levels of Reiki um, and spiritual healing and um, and again that was very effective and using using that in combination I would see some fantastic results um, with people and then from there I started to realize uh, the power of beliefs and started to study that uh, a lot, and so then I studied uh, a healing modality called Psych K, um, which is basically taking out limiting beliefs and putting positive beliefs, and making sure that those conscious beliefs are aligned with your subconscious and your superconscious or your spirit. Um, and then I then, after coming across George's material, um, started to look at what I was doing with the energy healing. Because I started to realize that there's this whole interdimensional interference side of it that comes into it. And then once you understand that, you then must look at what you're doing as a healer energetically. Um, and I think that's so important to do. Once you have that understanding and awareness, you read to really need to be careful of what you're actually doing with someone's energy. Um, your own, of course, but then if someone's coming to you and they're giving you, you know, under their free will, they're giving you permission to work with them um, energetically. You need to be really careful how you're working with that person. And, and after um, looking at George's material and having several discussions with George around this, I then changed the way I did energy healing from calling in different beings and whether it be Archangel Michael or um, and channeling information through through the session or, um, for example, taking that universal life force energy which is what reiki does and sending that through your hands into someone um i became aware that that was really probably opening that person up to um things that may initially seem good because of their master's evolution illusion but really um you know you're opening this person up to interdimensional interference and 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 being in um by um interdimensional interference and so what I do now with my healings I've changed that completely and now uh, with my intention it's two universal beings two spirits in the room there and together with their energy myself and the person that's there we we have a discussion in the beginning and we make sure the intentions are there and it's just going to be their power and my energy is two spirits having a chat together basically in the session and helping to unlock the power and energy of that person sitting on the table because we are the micro of the macrocosm, everything they need to heal is within them already. Every single possible scenario, every single dimension where they are healed and they've learnt the lessons, they've let go of the need to have that disease, is exists in them. So all I'm doing is accessing what already is inside them and getting wow. them to look at what they did and say that dimension within you, because when you're in your spirit where all things are known to you and you're all powerful, you can look at that and say, okay, let's access that part of you that has let go of cancer or has learnt the lesson of letting go of grief or whatever it is wow. and look at that and understand that and let that come to the front and assimilate through every cell of your being, every level of your aura and so on. And um, and then that what we do then is have that energy, so again through intention, have that energy once in the heart centre because that's where it's all at. You know, your heart is the first organ that develops in your body. It's where your spirit resides. And... So this energy is going on and these, these lessons and this information, this infinite love, infinite and unconditional love, wisdom and knowledge is, is coming and surfacing and, and starting to develop within the person. And we get that to go up to the brain, up to the hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus sends out new neuropeptides of information, this new information from the heart because the heart sends so much more information to the brain and the brain to the heart. And then that then spreads through the brain and gets sent out to every cell 
every sub all the subatomic levels all the dna and that filters through that new understanding and knowing from within them filters through and and, and goes throughout their whole being and all i'm doing as a as a as a healer is i'm just holding that space for them to go through that process for themselves and with my intention and their intention we create that happening on the table and so i move around i have my hands on different positions and so on sometimes i get them to um, hum different pitches and get to a frequency that helps balance that and send throughout the, that throughout the body um, i do use some some sound healing um, and um, and some essential oils and different things just to create that space and and that freedom for them to actually feel like they're in a safe space where they can actually go on that um you know that journey of incension rather than an ascension i used to be all about ascension now it's all about incension wow that's (laughs) i'm covered in goosebumps listening to you talk and and that big whammy right at the end there incension instead of ascension can you please explain to us um the two terms that you've just used sure ascension um was something that i was always working towards and i think a lot of people out there are especially in the new age movement and it's this idea of that we have to become and go somewhere higher than ourselves that there's these levels that are above us and that we're so down on this ladder and we need to climb these levels to get up to where these other higher beings are and where this existence is and straight away, as soon as you even make that statement or as soon as you even put out there that you need help from something outside of yourself, it's a statement to the universe that disempowers you. And I think that just fundamentally coming from that paradigm, you, it's just fundamentally flawed and you're really pushing shit uphill. But if you look at the, the opposite to that and what I call incension, and it's this journey within where you realise that that spirit, that essence that's in you, once this physical vehicle and this life passes away, your essence will journey on to its next adventure. And it has always existed. It will always exist. And within that essence is pure consciousness. It knows everything. It has infinite knowledge, power, wisdom, love. It's all there for you to access. And we are a microcosm of the macrocosm. And so everything that you do see outside you, when you look at the stars and you say, wow, look at all those stars in the sky, you know, estimated there's a 100 you know, over 100 trillion stars in the sky. It's estimated there's over 100 trillion cells in our body. The surface temperature of our skin, if you times that by 10, is the surface temperature of the sun. You look at the word human. Hue means God, God, man. Um, you look at the word elbow. Um, L is another name term for God, and bow is to rise up. So you've got all these terms through ancient languages and so on that you look at and you say, okay, well, why are there all these similarities? What are, what are they trying to tell us? What, what are these words and terms trying to tell us? And I believe that is, it is that we are gods and goddesses inside. We are universal creator beings inside and our spirit is that essence in us. And we're coming to a time now where that is the pivotal part of our journey is to realize who and what we are um, and not give power away to something outside of ourselves. And really... You know, the, the positive beings that do exist in our universe, they know and understand that. And they would never come in and save us. They would never do that. That completely disempowers us and is like, oh, my God, just as we're about to discover who and what we are and save ourselves and just absolutely just say no to all this interference, interdimensionally or otherwise, and take our power back and rise above it all, you know, that for them to come in just at the end and save us, just it, it defeats the purpose of the whole thing. Exactly. And so this incension is going in and realizing who and what we are and that we have everything we need um, inside of ourselves. That is... Unbelievable. <laughs> That's a triple gold medal, that one. <laughs> <laughs> you beauty. James, man, <laughs> you nailed it. Oh, wow. I'm still covered in goosebumps and my heart's singing with joy listening to you speak. And I tell you what, you've nailed it, James. And um, anybody who's listening to this and has listened to what I've said, you know, this James is now taking it to an, uh, giving it a, taking it to another level, giving it another um, perspective and another angle. And wow, this is magnificent, magnificent um, 
expressions going on here in sentient. Um, I'm going to ask permission now, James. Do you mind if I use that terminology from now on? Absolutely. The more the merrier, I reckon. And I, I just want to say thank you too. It means a lot coming from you guys. Um, those those compliments, I appreciate that very much. Oh, it's pure acknowledgement, mate, of uh, what is because you are you you are an incredible being. Jay and I have known that from the start, and uh, it's nice to be able to uh, share the platform and, and give you the opportunity to to shine your light in this world, which is so greatly needed at this point in time. Magnificent stuff. Um, okay, now, when you talked about... I'm, I'm going to play the devil's advocate with you now and uh, put out a bit of a challenge to the healing community and say, okay, because um, I did Reiki too and you did Reiki and you alluded to the inline thing going on there. Now, we're not here just to bag and rubbish or whatever. We're here to discuss, debate and explore and and discern. And so what I've discovered of late through doing holographic kinetics and intuitively knew prior to the holographic kinetics path that I that I chose to explore for a period of time, the Reiki symbols, because when I was doing Reiki, um, it was a wonderful thing at the time. And on one level, it does a wonderful job and it does help a lot of people. I've come to realize that there's something going on on higher levels or deeper levels to do with, uh, and, and I know we're just picking on one, we're just talking about Reiki now, but there's this, I'm going to say now, will flow onto every other modality that's out there because you've got healers that are um, that are channeling entities and they just put their hands on people and they go, oh, it's God's love or it's, oh, it's the love of Archangel Michael. Come along and, you know, I'll do the healing and, and they, oh, I'm just a channel. I just, it's just hands on. And they go, well, where's the energy coming from? Oh, it's coming, must be coming from God's love, you know, because it feels so wonderful. And so there's a lot of, uh, I would say blind healers out there and I would say I'm going to use the word ignorance as well it's a bit harsh I know but we are at the point in time of the journey where we've got to get real about this and start seeing things for what they truly are and so when we discuss the Reiki symbols what's behind these symbols who created them and when you follow the energetic path of the symbols um, I've had my experiences with it. Um, I'm just wondering, you, Jay, too, if you've had experiences with it, and also, James, w have you got any further comments to this scenario, this this topic? Yeah, I do. I think um, I agree. I think it's really time to, to get real about a lot of this stuff. And I think at one time, I think that Reiki was a very pure thing that did come from um, Grandmaster Yusui's spirit. Um, he was a normal man who who had this beautiful, you know, healing modality. But somewhere on the line, I've uh, my opinion is it got infiltrated, and they saw this as another way of um, accessing. They saw this. They said, "Hang on, these guys are getting onto something here. Uh, we better infiltrate that somehow, so we've got control of that." And so then they then now use that, I believe, as a way of um, as infiltrating and inlining. And they are masters of illusion. You've got to remember how easy it is for, for them to make us feel good. I mean, we can go and see a movie and they, they can have us crying, laughing, feeling absolute love out of our heart and just going, oh, my God, you know, you see this beautiful scene in a movie. It's not very hard to control human emotion. And so, of course, if you're wanting to have some sort of control mechanism, you're not going to send people along for healing and have them feeling terrible and have bad results and everything. You're going to give them just enough to make them feel good and shift a few things so they want to come back for more, you know. And that's what a lot of these new age things are. They do have positive effects, but they just don't deliver in their entirety because they don't want to, they don't want to give you the whole lot because they just want to give you enough to keep you coming back and keep you in a state of apathy and believing that just this love and light and bliss and all this stuff is going to be enough. And in my understanding and my research is that that's not the case. Um, I really think there's a whole other level of things going on that needs to be looked at here. And I agree with you, George. I think it's time to um, call things, call a spade a spade and um, ruffle some feathers and um, at least make people aware so that they can then make their own decisions once they've got all the information 
um, on the table. And talking about ruffling feathers, uh, James, we all did a holographic kinetics course together, George, yourself, and I, and a few others. Yep. And um, there were three or four Reiki kind of masters in that session. And you guys got together during a break and decided to uh, chase down the symbols behind Reiki. Would you like to share with me what you found? Um, we didn't uh, necessarily look specifically at the symbols and what was behind them. Um, St Steve uh, Richards, the, our teacher of holographic kinetics, um, was the person that alluded to there being, um, uh, you know, a negative energy behind the symbols and it's used to inline people. But what we did afterwards is we decided that we were going to cut off any um, agreements of entrapment or any inlining and take away any of the negative energy that was um, obviously coming through us as a channel and being Reiki masters. But then in doing that, we also then cut off any inlines and any negative energy we'd ever put into anyone we'd ever done a Reiki on, which would have amounted to thousands of people over the years. And so that was fantastic because, of course, that information, once you learnt it, that the guilt that came up around that was just quite incredible. Mm. And so it was just fantastic to be able to do that process there and, and, um, and disconnect that, that inlining and that, that energy and then straight away change the way um, I do energy healing. But I mostly do the holographic kinetics technique now. Um, I only use energy healing um, for people that maybe aren't ready to look at holographic kinetics because holographic kinetics is really about taking responsibility for why you've manifested things in your life, I think, at its core, and and look, really looking deeply at what's going on and looking at the interdimensional interference and so on. Um, and not everyone's ready to do that at the moment. Or what I find is maybe after a few energy healings and understanding that there is this spirit and this strength within them, then they can be ready and feel courageous enough to then maybe do some holographic kinetics work after that. Before we uh, get a bit further into holographic kinetics, which I really want to do for a few minutes, um, bringing these outside energies in. I don't know how many modalities do that now. There's probably hundreds, if not more. And it's very tempting to seek an answer outside of yourself. Let someone do all the hard work for you. And a topic that I know George is passionate about and something I've experienced firsthand is having a healing session where an entity or energy is brought from outside of you into you Well, how about that, gentlemen? We got cut out right there and then. Very interesting. <laughs> hey? <laughs> about to serve it up to them and they uh, cut me yeah. off. Oh, I don't need to listen to this. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. The timing of it. Oh, it's just poetry. Poetry in motion. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> Wow. All right, we, we, we were talking about holographic kinetics before we all got cut off and dropped out and right on cue, I suppose. Isn't that amazing? Well, I was going to introduce tagging. That's what I was going to do for you, George. That's where I was leading to. Yeah, let's let's go back to that. Let's continue on, shall we? So about um, when we bring entities or, or we're using entities or we're using something outside of ourselves because a lot of healers say, oh, I'm, I'm using universal light. I'm using God's light, source light. Uh, and to me, they're labels and anyone can label anything they want. You can go and, and take a 44 gallon drum and put the label on it, God's light. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you can just call anything, anything you want. So just because someone label uses a label, universal light, source light, God's light, angel's light, whatever they want to call it, doesn't mean it is that. And the other question is, okay, if it's universal light that they're using for healing, which universe is that universal light coming from? Is it coming from a pseudo-universal paradigm that's been created by a God entity that solicits worship from people? Or, uh, or is it the greater universe? And if it is from the greater universe, then surely that light will be coming out from within a person because that's the organic connection to the true universal light. It's not 
something you bring down through a crown chakra or something like that. It's not something someone channels into themselves and then out through the hand. It's something that emanates from the core heart of the being. So these are the kind of little, I would say, discrepancies and issues and discernments for me that are paramount when it comes to healing, when it comes to healers, and when it comes to the utilization of energies and labels that are used. Very, very important to consider all these. But it goes deeper, George. It goes deeper. You uh, once told me more than once on how these energies coming through from outside of you are a form of energetic tagging. And uh, at first I went, come on. It's hard to get your hand around those kind of concepts. You see yourself as a, you know, a cattle, you know, a cow with an ear tag on being tagged. Um, It was just a little bit much for me to kind of get my head around in the early days. And when we were doing holographic kinetics, I had a treatment with uh, a practitioner who's been doing it for a while, much longer, for about at least three or four years. And I had severe back injury. And when he removed two entities, uh, one was a, a reptilian and the other one was tall, dark grey, and that's enough to freak you out, that these entities surface through your body, confront you. you You know you're you and you can feel these entities and doing uh, Steve's course is even more confronting. But the interesting thing about it, you can actually trace where that entity entered um, in what dimension, even what lifetime. Yeah, back through time and space. Yeah, and and these these particular entities um, that I had uh, came through one when I was a child, screaming out for help um, after being, uh, let's say, abused by my father. And the second one, which was even more interesting, was traced back to a place in Brazil. Um, we don't like to name it shame here, and you can probably work it out, people who know about it, but there's a healing centre in Brazil and everyone dresses in white and uh, they ch- the, the actual guy who runs the show channels different entities and, and does these amazing healings. And I was there at a time when my business was absolutely failing and I, and I asked and, entity for help. And psychic surgery. Yeah, psychic surgery, um, amazing demonstrations in front of people. Just gets a knife, literally a knife or a scalpel sometimes, just makes big incisions. No anaesthetic in front of scores of people, maybe more, and pulls out clots and tumours and a whole range of things. Does it in people's eyes. It's it's really full on. Um, But the interesting thing for for me getting back to tagging was this entity was traced back to that healing centre. And... Because I asked for help, the, ed- the entity said, yes, I'll help you. And they did. Don't get me wrong. They really helped me. They gave me a massive contract. <laughs> that was a whole story in itself. But they also put this entity inside of me. And I just went, what? Here I am, if, you know, years later, 10 years later, doing a holographic kinetics treatment. And this entity that's surfaced through me and voicing through my mouth, not me talking, I know it's a bit hard to get your head around, but this entity voices and says it came through in that particular session. And I just went, there you go. There is hard evidence, Joe, it's about tagging. And it just shocked my world. It just really shocked my world. And George, you you know a lot more about this than I do, and maybe you want to talk about how these energetic um, external healing techniques may be more than just curing. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, there's a lot more going on than people realise. And uh, the, this tagging system, if you think like you can put a physical implant into a person and that implant will influence, uh, will, will go about, depending on the implant, but most of the time it'll be uh, one designed to connect to like the central nervous system, um, or even, even just in the peripheral nervous system. And... Uh, will then have some sort of electromagnetic and electrical uh, through the nervous system, electrical impulses and electromagnetic influ- influences on that person, their being. I've had them, I've still got them and I am I know about them and this is the way they work. But then there's also, let's go to another level, we're light-based beings. So if there's going to be a multidimensional assault on humanity, there's going to be entities that are going to have some very sophisticated light-based implants 
and ethereal implants and, and you know, like uh, astral implants, for example, and uh, interdimensional implants. And how are they going to do that? You know, how, how are they going to override the law, universal law of non-interference? So when you want help, when you are praying, when you are yearning and you are aching and you are in that place of despotism and, and, and you're opening up yourself to uh, really want some help, then you've got to be careful what you ask for because uh, these entities are coming in and while they're, someone is putting their hands on somebody and they're channeling Archangel Michael or Saint Germain or, or uh, so-called God's light and, and universal light under all the different names and guises and, and different flavours that it's presented in different cultures, um, then it's through these channels and mediums that they are getting their tentacles into people and tagging people. And, and oh, look, some, some people will hear this and go, this is just disinformation to totally discredit the healing community. No, it's not. This is real information, realistic information, facts, um, designed to get people to discern between a healer that has not just the right intentions, because overwhelming majority of, of healers do, but somebody who's working from an organic perspective and is using organic techniques compared to somebody that's working with synthetic light constructs and is using externalization techniques and, and techniques that have been, um, they've been assimilated into and indoctrinated into by others and by other entities who have imposed their practices and their doctrines into the human arena and into the human psyche. So this is what we're talking about here. And, and I think James is a glowing example of a person who has really taken a step back and really had a good look at what it is he's doing and how he's going about it and has now blended and, and has managed to morph, I would say, his healing modalities and his healing techniques to now come from a place of an organic uh, universal energy and and a place from within his own heart rather than externalizing giving their power away so this tagging issue is big have is there something that you can share with us james to elaborate on that yeah there is i've um since i've been doing the holographic kinetics um i've now done hundreds and hundreds of clients and uh in the last year or so and i i see this and these are people that are coming in that I, i've they have never heard of interdimensional interference before. There's, you know, and especially in the beginning, I'd sort of put it to the test. I wouldn't say anything to them, wouldn't mention it. And then there we are um, going back, like you said, Jason, to a point where, yes, there's it comes up through muscle testing and so on, that there's interdimensional interference on there. And we, we clear that out for them. And then we go back to the very first agreement of entrapment where this came on board. And sometimes it's in this life, other times it's in a past life or it's through an ancestor. And they're there and their spirit is communicating on the table, describing this situation where they've either call, called out for help, they've been involved in some sort of ritual, um, because there's different ways that they can come on board, you know, these interventional interference. Often it's when they're praying to something outside of themselves. Um, a lot of the time they've been involved in some sort of uh, religious ritual with been calling in energy, uh, all these beings, like you said, George, into themselves. Um, so there's many different ways that they can come on board. But I've firsthand witnessed this for myself in hundreds of clients who, and, I, and we see, and their spirits they're witnessing as well, and they see for themselves during a session just how these different beings can um, present themselves. And I very interestingly had a, 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 a colleague of mine come in who, was uh, very much still in the doing the Reiki treatments and in that way of thinking that you get this power and information from these beings. And in the session, she's saying that this uh, beautiful angel is coming down out of the sky and is sharing her with all this information and knowledge, and it's just a beautiful thing. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, okay, we're we're going back here, spirit, to look at an, a negative aspect, but you're describing this beautiful positive experience. And so then I remember what Steve taught me doing holographic kinetics. And I said, Spirit, have a good look at this angel that's ascending down and showering you with this light and this information, this knowledge, and ask it to reveal, demand that it reveal its true nature and that it reveal its true nature now. And as soon as she did that, 
this person was reeling on the table. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's this disgusting, ugly gargoyle. And I'd never mentioned the word gargoyle to her, never spoken to her about anything. She'd never had any experience of any of this stuff before in her life. But once she, under universal law, commanded her spirit to look at that energy and demand that it reveal its true nature, that's what appeared to her. And that really cemented it for me. And I've had many, many situations since then that have led me to conclude and agree 100% with you, George, uh, about these beings being masters of illusion and presenting themselves in a way that, of course, if you've got this being sitting there and you're feeling this love and light in you and you're thinking, oh, my God, you've been trained to believe that these are beautiful beings, it's only natural that you then you know, allow that energy to infiltrate into you. And it's, I think it's so important that people become aware through your work, George, and through others and listening to this recording that you just have to really be careful what you're calling in and what you're dealing with. Exactly. And, and I want to share another example of um, a very, very close dear friend of mine who also um, went back to a point in time to their life as an angel. And they were a beautiful winged angel being. And, and they're incarnated on earth now. And they had a life of servitude over many eons and eras of time as this angelic being. And towards the end of its, its its life of servitude as an angelic being, it knelt before what it considered the light of God. And rising within itself in that moment was the shift that took place within this angel of light. And this angel of light, kneel, kneeling before the light of God, all of a sudden looked up towards that light and said, I command you reveal your true nature now. And as that light um, changed this, the, it, it morphed into another sort of beautiful looking being. And then the angel of light said, no, I command you now to reveal your true nature and your true identity. And then all the, all the beautiful resonance disappeared and all the light disappeared. And what was left was this ugly winged serpent. It was a shock to this being. And from that moment on, it left that angel angelic kingdom that it was in servitude as an angelic being and uh, ha is now incarnate on earth. So the point I'm trying to make here is not to cast doubt into people's minds or to attack the light because I'm dark and I'm evil. It's not about that. It's about naivety. That's what it's about. Don't be so naive. Please don't be so naive. Start getting a grip on reality and understand this universe has been around for a very long time. These beings have been around for a very long time. They are masters of illusion. And, you know, it's written, even the elite will be deceived. And you've got to come to terms with this reality. Even though your egoic identity and, and your, your spiritual egoic identity with these healing modalities can't fathom the thought that maybe I'm healing people and I'm doing something wrong. Well, you better start questioning. You better start being sceptical about what you're doing because you have every right to ask and keep asking and keep discerning because any being that you're working through who is of an organic nature in the universe will welcome that, will relish that you are embarking on this journey of the truth seeker of self-empowerment and, and be sceptical, be a true sceptic because that is what it means to be the, the you know, a truth seeker. And behind this illusion of light is something very dark and evil indeed, because they've mastered the ability to control not only through evil and dark, which is the traditional uh, concept of, of a controlling nature. No, no, no. They have mastered how to control and manipulate through the energy of love and light. This is the key, key element to understanding what's going on here in the bigger picture. And that's why... We are having such a fantastic discussion with, with James here. James says, I know there's um, other experiences and examples we can use. And if you feel there's another example to use, please, please share it with us in this moment, because I think we are now touching on the key, key issues of the world of healing and what's actually going on in the world of healing on this planet today. I agree. And I think that, um, you know, really it's about <clears throat> them creating apathy. You know, if, if we're all sitting there and we're 
going to be healed and we're giving our power away to something outside of ourselves and these beings through being mass evolution are you know giving enough and they do they give enough energy and positiveness because they are powerful beings and they can create some healing and some good feelings in us so that we buy into that but then we go away and we sit there in our peace and tranquility for a little while and we're apathetic we don't do anything we're not cottoning on to the fact that there's this whole planetary, multidimensional, universal, multi-universal um, war for control of our souls. And by doing that, they lay back and, and they're apathetic. They don't do anything. You know, they, there's a saying, evil exists when good men do nothing. And unfortunately, that's what I feel the whole New Age movement is geared towards, is the powers that be that are controlling at the top are wanting us to be apathetic, sit back and think it's all good, love and light will fix it all. And unfortunately, that's not what, what's taking place. We need to become aware and seek the truth, even if initially that truth is overwhelming and a bit scary and disheartening. But it's through that power and through that realisation is we discover who and what we are. And as soon as we discover who and what we are, take back our free will and our sovereign beingness then just through our free will and intention, they cannot feed off our emotions anymore. They cannot interfere and we become who we are and we're meant to be. And I think that's really what it's all about. And I think it's so important, George, I agree, that people um, become aware of this. And it's really interesting too that there's a lot of hyp hypnotherapists coming forward now and there's a, the head of psychiatry at Harvard University. He's worked with again, a very prestigious college, he's actually come across a lot of alien abduction cases. And um, and what a lot of these hypnotists are finding out, not just singular cases, This is, you're talking about thousands of cases showing the same thing. And in, <clears throat> in these abductions, to get these people to come and do these things and, and go with them, they're appearing as ascended masters, they're appearing as angels, they're appearing as beautiful women, they're appearing as movie stars even. And then what happens is once they're there and once they're being interfered with and so on, all of a sudden that, that mask fades away and what they're left with, and it's this common, again, this common theme, is this dark, disgusting-looking energy. And so, you know, it's not just in cases we're seeing holographic kinetics. A lot of kinesiology uh, people are starting to come across similar things. I get phone calls from psychiatrists saying, look, I've been t chatting with this person. All of a sudden this thing surfaced and, you know, in someone. And so they're, it's, it's starting to become more and more realized out there that there's something else going on, um, which is fantastic. It is fantastic because it's, you know, it's also the cathartic process of humanity as a whole, not just on an individual basis. And what we're seeing is, you know what it, it is the apocalypse it's the revealing isn't it so what's been hidden is now coming to the surface and those with the eyes to see will see and ears to hear will hear and you know i know i'm just pulling out these um what some people term as uh, religious uh, quotes but they're not they're the threads of truth that have made it through and uh, and it comes down to your interpretation of these uh, sayings as well very very important and um i'm going to pull out a quote from henry palmgram of red ice radio here it's the slumberfication of humanity. I love that quote because it is the deathly slumber. I mean, the trance that people are being, um, I would say, induced into. It, it's it's a deeper trance. It's a, it's another level of trance. This um, this multi-dimensional assault on humanity and and the way people are being tagged by all these healers. If we can take a step back. And, and, and realize that this whole area has been infiltrated as well. And it, it takes a lot for someone like yourself, James, to realize and, and to make a stand about it because it has an impact on your colleagues around you and, and those around you, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And I've even lost some clients um, since I've changed and been talking to people about different ways of doing things. Um, <clears throat> and some people, they don't want to look at that yet. And and that's okay. That's okay because they're not ready, but at least that seed's been planted. And so next time, you know, something's coming up, the next time they go to a meditation circle and they're being asked to call these beings into them and have them talk out of them, they'll, they'll just they'll go, well, hang on. And it's, as long as they hear this and at some level when they're ready, 
that information will, their spirit will recognise that and come forward when it needs to. Um, and I think you're right, George. I think if it's not being controlled by religion and rocking up to church every Sunday and doing a satanic ritual, I used to wonder what the hell was going on. I used to think, hang on, this doesn't seem very nice as a kid. I'd sit down there, they're <laughs> eating the body of Christ and they're drinking his blood. Mm. Like, I, I just don't feel comfortable with that. And then later on down the track, you, you think, hang on, that's, that's very symbolic of satanic ritual, you know? Exactly. And you start to question these things. So if they're not controlled and bombarded and kept in very, very rigid uh, control mechanisms and being in line that way, they've then ingeniously created a new age movement to in line them in that way. When people are walking away from that going, oh, that religion, that's controlling, that's not very nice, you know, it doesn't feel good, and I'm going to open up to this new age spiritual movement. And, you know, they've infiltrated that as well. But there's a next level of that. And this next level is self-empowerment and incension and discovering who and what we are. And it's through this awareness. And I understand that people initially can be um, think it's very negative and so on. And that's another thing that in the New Age movement is they, you know, there's this real push to don't talk about anything negative, don't give it energy. And I just think that's, again, that's misinformation because you need to be aware of things and you need to, you know, look at your shadow side, look at the shadow side of humanity and the multidimensional universes that we live in and see things for what they are. And only then when you understand the game, the rules of the game, and who and what you are and get in contact with the power of your own spirit, can you um, transform and transmute these things and rise above it? Yeah, so well said, because when we live in denial, when it's, it's really, it's everywhere in the New Age movement, isn't it? Don't talk about it. Um, they just can't go there. The moment you share anything with any negative connotation, they freak out. They become so delicate and so um, soft um, that they there's, they just haven't the capacity any longer to cope with anything negative. And it, it's, it's really sad. They become so weak. Even though they think they're so empowered and so strong, it's actually the opposite. And, and, and by living in denial, because that's what it is, it's denial of the shadow side, um, they're creating an internal division without them realising it. Mm. That's right. And that's, uh, you know, designed that way isn't it it's uh, absolutely put in there just like it is in religion for someone that talks about something other than jesus or other than um, muhammad or other than the things within there and you look and you say how can religion if it's supposed to be spiritual have these people fighting and warring against each other i look at the new age movement and i understand that because i understand when i'm challenging their idea and their hope i mean they're really clinging on to this as their answer and their hope and their salvation and you come in and challenge that I get it. People have fought wars over this and killed, you know, wiped out massive amounts of people for to hold on to their hope and their belief. So I really understand where they're coming from. But if if you just allow some of this stuff and to look into it and to research it, you can really find out a lot of stuff that's going on. And and then and I think that's where people like us guys really need to not only give them the information and the truth, but then also offer uh, ways of, much like some of the ancient shamanic cultures did, ways of empowering themselves and connecting to the power of their spirit and, and you know, give them some, some answers and some hope through some things that they can do to, um, to have that side of their lives reintroduced to them. Yeah, it was, ma it was magic when you said earlier about, you know, when you do the healing modality that it's uh, your being this your spirit and the spirit of the person and and it's the synchronicity and the symphony of those two energies that actually do the healing that's just music to my heart yeah it's beautiful james it's great to uh see the transition from ascension to incension i've been lucky enough to know you for a few years now and i've seen that transition and you've, it's just fantastic i'm just so happy <laughs> and I'd just like you to share with the healers that are listening. There's a lot of egos that are now crying, screaming, being challenged. You lived this. You went through it, and it wasn't easy moving from the ascension to the incension path. Would you like to share a few words for me? Sure. Um, you're absolutely right, Jason. It, was, it wasn't easy. It was very overwhelming, and it really shattered a lot of the long-held um, beliefs that I had. 
And I then suddenly thought automatically, I just went through all the thousands of conversations I've had with people about um, telling them to do these things that, you know, may have in, in directly caused them um, to be inlined and that sort of thing. But I also believe that quite often the new age movement, I, if I didn't go through that experience, I wouldn't have been here at this experience because naturally to get into the new age movement, you start to, it's an inherent thing that you start to look at, you know, the food you're eating and you start to become a bit wiser on organic food and you start to hear about terms of, you know, the banking elite, the Illuminati. And, and, and if you're a curious person and you're a truth seeker, a true truth seeker, you naturally go on the path of getting to the bottom of it. And then all of a sudden you might be there and you might be doing Reiki or pranic healing and you're eating your organic food and you're finding out about how the pharmaceutical, so pharmaceutical industry are doing these negative things and there's control and you know conspiracies and secrets getting kept and all the rest of it. And just, I would say, is just continue your research. Don't stop there because there is another higher level to this. And when you then look at the Illuminati and you realise that there's a dark cabal that are controlling the Illuminati, it takes it to a whole new level. You realise the interdimensionality of it all. And that's what I think opens up the whole possibility of this. And then you start to come into some of the works of, you know, like George, and read and do your research and decide for yourself. Your spirit will recognise truth and just allow your time to incubate because I, I have this belief that people can only go up levels of consciousness at a time and you need to do a bit of research and then give yourself time to let that incubate, let it assimilate, let yourself have some time to dream and to deal with and let go of things. And you just start that journey of going inwards and do you continue to do your research. And then I think it's important for people that are going on this journey to then get together so they can ask questions and they can talk about, you know, maybe any fears that are coming up and have forums and places where people can meet and discuss this thing and, and we can sort of come together as that true human family um, and reconnect with the power of our spirits and, and who and what we are. But I, I feel for people on that journey. I've been there for myself and I still to this day go through times where you think, wow, you know, some of the stuff that's going on there because I, I continually try and do research and seek truth and looking, try and beyond and look for more and more. And some days you do come across some things and you go, wow, that's, that's really not great news, <laughs> you know, but um, by understanding what's out there and what's going on, it's only then that we can then look at how we deal with this and how we move through and, and, and overcome these things and, and truly be empowered. Yeah, and one of the one of the most challenging um, things I found was peer pressure. Absolutely, um, that's very very true. I mean, you know, you start to. I've been fortunate or unfortunate enough to be a black sheep most of my life. I've always been <laughs> spouting off different things, and then ten years later, people start going, "Oh, actually, yeah, fluoride isn't great," you know. And so I always seem to, and just as I start to get into the new age movement and. Everyone is starting to become a bit more popular, and all of a sudden now I'm onto this whole other <laughs> journey. Um, and you know, I think um, accepting where you're at and and having understanding for yourself and taking it easy on yourself, you know, and it's okay to disagree with other people. It's it's all right. You know, there has to be. You we're here. We chose to be here on this journey at this point in time and having this awareness right now. We're meant to be doing this, and it's okay to have opposition and to have discussions with people and, and if you find yourself having peer pressure, I think it's um, it, it's just opportunity, isn't it, really, to uh, plant some seeds and to share some information and people will accept it when they're ready. Fantastic. It's important that everyone understands that the experiential process that people go through is as important, if not more important, than any other scientific measure. Everyone wants to put it down. Oh, that's just his experience. It doesn't count because it's not double-blind controlled studies. <laughs> yeah. that's, just, that's just crap. It's just not true. And when you have someone like James sharing his experience, he's lived it, that process from ascension, 4D ascension, into the greater aspects of incension is just fantastic. That's why this show was so great. It's experiential. It really counts.
There's nothing stronger than that. Totally agree. Well, I think it's winding up here, but before we go, George, um, a lot of people ask me, and I think I ask you as well, how did you recover from your illness? Because you were very sick, like a decade of pretty full-on illness. Can you share with us how you managed that? Yeah, it was it was quite severe. It was a lot more severe than people realise because I, I'm someone who's always put on a brave front. And so people would look at me and go, oh, there's nothing wrong with him, he's just putting it on. <laughs> And they just had no idea, really. Uh, they are so quick to judge. And I would say the turning point for me was when I was grateful for my condition. Um, that was the key ingredient, I think, which then allowed everything else to find a synergy to have a more positive effect and, uh, and, and help turn things around. It's the gratitude for me, was the most powerful, as well as um, minerals are important because like the, the soil in the US, the Australian soil is similar, whereas it lacks quite a few minerals. We're not, we're not a volcanic, we don't have a lot of vol volcanic um, soil here. And uh, like you say, New Zealand or Europe or what have you, where the food just tastes magnificent and has a lot more nutrients in it. Uh, and so minerals were important to build that stronger foundation in my body, thanks to my beloved Cynthia, um, who made these recommendations. Um, and there was also greens were important and living foods, as James has spoken of earlier, is very important. And I think once that synergy starts to take place, it's it's a transformation that starts not, it's not an instant fix. It's something that, that happens over a long period of time. It's kind of like the, the difference between the tortoise and the hare. And when you do it properly, you do it slowly and it gets done right. And sure, there's days where you go backwards a little bit, you know, the old, you know, four steps forward and two steps back, and then you go another three steps forward and one step back. And, you know, that takes place. You have cycles. And it's important to accept that those cycles are part of the healing course and the healing path. And But that peace within and that gratitude for me is paramount. I, I've got to keep going back to that because my circumstances have taught me, moulded me into the man I am today and also taught those around me. So if anyone's got cancer, for example, you just got to realise just how much of a magnificent teacher you are by carrying this um this this situation that you're in so and having this 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 ease taking place within our our beingness our bodies we we go into a place of being a great teacher not only to ourselves but to those around us so these are the sort of qualities to look at why a set of circumstances is taking place and it's very empowering because you it really helps you take out out of victimhood and you think wow i'm teaching people so there is something good that's coming from this i'm not i don't have to be miserable about it all anymore and play the victim and poor me and and everyone else has got to be miserable around you no the whole thing could be turned around into something magnificent and once the universe is now receiving a different broadcast of signals emanating from you because you've gone through the shift inside of you the world around you then changes and also your body is now resonating this new frequency. So the set of circumstances required to that more often than that, that will more often than not will help rewrite the program energetically and physically in your body and also in the world around you. Everything changes. Perfect. I think that wraps it up. James, I want to thank you so much for coming along. It's been a great couple of hours we've shared together and yeah, I'm just so, so happy to see you. The path of incension. I think that's the new word for the year. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Incension. Um, James, we are so incredibly grateful for you sharing your wisdom with us and shining your magnificent um, beingness and your magnificent light. We instantly acknowledged it from day one when we first met you and you have not left our hearts and I want um, to give you the last word here today James and, and pretty much 
you know, the message you have for our beloved human family, for our beloved Mother Earth, and also once again share with us your information, your website, your um, what you're doing, what James Park is about. So go right ahead, James, and, and love and gratitude from my heart, mate. Thanks very much, George and Jason. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to have a chat with you guys here and, and your comments. So it really means a lot coming from you too. Um, yeah, our, our website again is um, www.resonate, which is R-E-Z-I-N-A-T-E dot com dot A-U. And the services um, my wife and I offer, and you know, we do obviously do face-to-face -face healing sessions like the holographic kinetics and the Psyche K and energy healing. And I also do uh, intuitive guidance readings. Um, but we can also do those over the phone or Skype and distance healing sessions as well. So there's opportunities to do that wherever you are in the world. And to wrap up, my message to, to people would be to is to, to stop and, and, and take a look. I think if you really take some time to tune into your heart center, there's a lot of people that are having anxieties and going through up and down days and everything. And, and when you are feeling like that, those feelings are your spirit and your body's way of trying to tell you that something is afoot. And if you take some time out to listen to your own heart, turn off the TVs and the iPods and the distractions for a little while and just allow yourself to take your energy within and just listen to what's going on. And then follow some of that intuitive guidance and do a little bit of research. Start to look into some of these things that we've discussed on today's show and allow your intuition and your feelings to guide you on your journey from there and you'll go on a path of self-discovery that'll be truly amazing. At times confronting, but the empowerment that comes with knowing what's really going on is just fantastic. And, and to allow yourself um, some time to acknowledge your emotions and your feelings, allow yourself some time to heal. Because I think there's really a wondrous journey ahead for all of us. I think we're coming up to some beautiful shifts in our time, I think we've, uh, we're looking at the greatest show on earth and we've got front row tickets. And to be able to, to be here at this time, experience the time where humanity truly becomes empowered, steps in and remembers and awakens to who and what they are and how amazingly powerful they are. That we're not these weak and feeble sinners that need to be forgiven. We are these beautiful gods and goddesses, these universal light beings. And once we start to realize that and share that with each other, imagine just the incredible times we're going to have and the way the world can truly be, whether it be in this dimension or another dimension, but there's just beautiful things ahead for us. And uh, I'm very excited to be here and to share this space and time with you guys. And um, I look forward to catching up more and hopefully catching up with the people that might be listening. And I think the more we get together, um, people have heard of that 100th monkey uh, effect and um, I think the more of us that, that wake up and and go within connect with our hearts and our spirits and then connect with each other I think um, I think there's beautiful things that can come from that it's very exciting thanks James thanks Jason thank you George thank you George thank you Jason thanks James <laughs> good night John boy <laughs> <Good night, Mary. laughs> Yeah, I just want to make the comment, you know, we've uh, talked a lot about holographic kinetics and we have put a fair bit of emphasis on it. It's just like any other healing modality. It's very important that we don't make any healing modality, including holographic kinetics, our everything. And because the moment we do that, we are basically creating a religion out of it. They're all tools to have in your toolbox. And I'll say HK is kind of a bit like a sledgehammer, if you want to put it that way. It's, it's a very serious tool to have in your toolbox. But again, with just like every single other healing modality out there, we, we exist far beyond any need for any healing modalities in the higher frequencies and the higher dimensions and, and beyond that. So have a really good consideration about uh, what we've talked about in this fantastic discussion. Also, just bear in mind and have a balanced perspective on life. Make sure that you don't give your power away to, to anything and that includes healing modalities and that includes holographic kinetics. Thank you. This fantastic music has been brought to you by Medwin Goodall. 
We're going to close the show now with a song called The Round Table because it feels like we've been three nights of old sitting around the round table talking about the big subjects of life and confronting the big issues and the big energies of life. So enjoy and we'll see you next time. Shine bright.